Welcome to Glorious Professionals, brought to you by Go Ruck Media. I'm Jason here in Jacksonville Beach, Florida with Rich. And today, our guest on episode lucky number 13 is Lieutenant General Ken Tovo, a Green Beret who most recently served as Commanding General of the United States Army Special Operations Command, USASOC before retirement in 2018 after 35 years of military service. His operational assignments include the first Gulf War, refugee relief in Northern Iraq, non-combatant evacuation in Sierra Leone, peacekeeping in Bosnia twice, five tours in Iraq, and one tour in Afghanistan. A fun fact is that he was my group commander at 10th Special Forces Group while I was there from 2006 to 2008. He had the respect of the guys, officers, and enlisted alike, and he was exactly the kind of leader we wanted to follow into war. And I don't know how to pay him any higher compliment than that. Today, we're going to dive deep into the general's leadership lessons learned in times of crises, and specifically discuss Operation Viking Hammer, the special forces-led unconventional operation during the Iraq War in 2003. Sir, thank you for coming on Glorious Professionals. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for inviting me. So let's start with your youth. Why West Point? How did that come about? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I'd love to be able to tell you a story about how I did all this great analysis and I knew exactly what I wanted. But in the end, uh, what I really wanted to do was go to the Air Force Academy and fly jets, uh, be a fighter pilot. I'd been into rooms filled with model airplanes, uh, pictures of, of fighter aircraft from World War II. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, and then uh, at some point, uh, in high school or junior high, I guess, I realized that I didn't have the eyesight to, to pass the medical requirements for to be a pilot. And so I looked around at, uh, at other opportunities uh, and decided perhaps I'd, I'd go to either uh, Annapolis or, or uh, West Point, be either a Marine or, or go into the Army. And uh, I'd like to say it was a really well thought out decision. I, you know, I had the big decision makers. I weighed all the all the factors but the reality was a friend of mine that's uh, in high school's brother was going to West Point and he convinced me that uh, I didn't really want to be a Marine. We had these great things inside the Army called Rangers and Green Berets, and I'd probably rather be one of those instead. And in fact, big benefit. I could go to Ranger School one summer as a cadet at West Point. So that's why I chose West Point. Um, otherwise, I'd have been in the Marine Corps. So they would let you go to ranger school. And, and, you know, that's like 62 days of just pure and utter suck, right? Yeah. About as bad as it gets in, you know, I know there's three green braids here, but only two of us have been to ranger school and I'm not the one who's been to ranger school. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's not something that everyone usually is, is dying to go do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can say within this community of the three of us, you, you know, that, um, the special operations community, the you know, SF, the Green Berets, Rangers, the, our whole community, whether it's in the you know, whatever service, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine, et cetera, uh, we tend to attract people who have a different idea of what fun looks like. Exactly. Uh, most people wouldn't think that two months of one meal a day, couple hours of sleep, constant walking, with a large rucksack through swamps, deserts, mountains was a lot of fun, but you know, we're a different, a different breed, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and I will say that as hard as Ranger school was, it was, um, and it was very hard. It, it wasn't to me, at least as hard as our SEER course inside the, the special forces green beret path. So survival, evasion, resistance, escape, right? Yep. Survival is evasion, resistance, escape, the uh, learning the lessons of what it's like to run behind enemy lines when being chased. How do you survive if uh, if you've lost all of your connectivity to the big green machine of you know constant resupply, et cetera? How do you live off the land? And if you're captured, how do you survive that experience? It was really created by one of the icons, uh, two of the icons, really, of uh, special forces. Uh, Colonel Nick Rowe, and uh, I don't remember uh, his his final rank, but I think he retired as a, as a first sergeant uh, uh, pitcher who had been in POWs in Vietnam and uh, and used their lessons, their personal experience to create for special forces uh, a course that would enable them to survive if captured 
in some future future war. Nick Rowe and Danny Pitzer were both friends of mine. I had already gone to the Navy Seer School in Bangor, Maine, and they tried to convince me to go through their school after they'd completed it, and I cautiously turned them down, like, hell no, I'm not going to that thing. Yeah, so it's, Seer School's not the kind of place you want to go to twice. I mean, Ranger School isn't either, but Seer School, I mean, the the resistance training laboratory, the the final few days when you're you're an actual mock POW, I mean, that's... It's really not fun. <laughs> well, I guess I guess this may be insights that uh, you don't want to know, but you say it's not something you want to go to twice. I actually volunteered to go back when I was a team leader in 1st Battalion, 10th Group. I wanted to take my whole team through because I felt like, uh, you know, when you go through that course, to me, it was the, the most professionally run uh, training program I had been to in my army career. And I would say in many ways, I think it still is. And I've been to a lot of them. I thought it was incredibly uh, well done. I thought it was incredibly valuable. And at the time I was on a team, this is still when the Cold War was uh, you know, kind of coming coming to an end, but still the focus of our existence is on a team in Germany and Betholz. And our mission was going to be to parachute into Poland, uh, but we were going to be in a significant high risk environment. And I felt like the rest of my team needed the experience that I had gained in Sears School. And I really felt like it would be able to go through as a team. And so I volunteered to bring the whole team back. Unfortunately, given the way school quotas were, we couldn't get the, uh, you know, the 10 or 11 slots we needed all at the same time to go. But, uh, but, I, but I was willing to go again. I felt like I'd have been much better I, in second I, I, it almost sounds like that's the type of thing you, you walk up to your, your commanding officer and you say, I want to send my whole team back to Sears school. And you're kind of wondering if he's going to call your bluff. Just, just, I mean, when there's a badass mission that he's going to assign down, of course, he's going to pick the team that, that volunteered to go to Sears school again together. I, I got to tell you, it really wasn't, I, I'd like to think that I had that much uh, forethought and I was working all the options. It was really more, I, I looked, you know, I got there, I, I inherited a war plan that literally was, you're going to parachute into Poland, do some things. Uh, when it's time to leave, you're going to walk west. <laughs> However far the front line is at that time, you're going to walk west. And so we had this plan where we were going to break down into, you know, four three man elements for the evasion back home. And, and I looked at that and I said, okay, the chances of us surviving this are pretty damn small. But if we're going to make them at least a little better, we at least, we, we got to train some guys in, in how, to, how to do some of these things that we'll have to do on what was about uh, you know, several hundred miles of walking. I'm one of those very, very glad we never had to execute that plan. Yeah. I want to go back. You got to go to ranger school while you were at West Point. Actually, I didn't go because they, they canceled that program. So I didn't get to go. Oh, you I were just to wait sort of. until after I was graduating. Yeah, Rich, Rich has got a million <laughs> stories about what he was sold on and they got him into all sorts of new schools that led to all sorts of new stuff. I kind of went the same route you did uh, when I knew that I was going to get drafted or thought I was going to get drafted uh, back during the days of Vietnam and everything was going on. Uh, I decided that I needed to to pick where I was going to go. And the Air Force was my first pick. Seemed like a good idea. They lived the best as best I could tell. I didn't, I knew a few peripheral facts about them. I didn't know a lot that was going on inside, but it seemed like a, a good place to go. Unfortunately, when I got there, they informed me that their quotas were filled uh, for the next like 18 months. And so then I went to the Navy and I said, well, you know, and they were, they were filled for like 14 months. And I'm like, damn it. Then I just happened to walk by the army place and they saw me coming. I walked in and of course their quotas were not filled for that week, that day, that hour. They said, all right, uh, you know, we, we'll be happy to plug you in somewhere. Uh, what would you like to do? And I said, well, you know, I like the outdoors and stuff like that. And they said, well, what have you done recently? And I said, well, I just finished an a Ian Fleming, James Bond book. And he said, I got the thing for you. He said, we have something called the Army Security Agency. Uh, I perceived the way he said it as a super kind of secret organization that did special things. And I said, oh, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, he said, we can make you an agent or an agent handler. So I immediately had the thought of me 
in Berlin in a trench coat and a fedora with a cigarette waiting for some beautiful blonde to come by and pass me something in the night. So I signed on the dotted line, went to Fort Ord, California, got started basic training and the ASA guys showed up and said, all right, high speed radio intercept or radio teletype repair. What do you want to do for four years? And I said, well, neither one of those. I said, I signed up to be a, an agent or an agent handler. And they just laughed at me and said, we'll be back tomorrow. Think about it and pick radio teletype repair or high speed radio intercept. Well, overnight, the recruiter for the airborne showed up and his friend from special forces. And that's when I got recruited for the airborne. Later on, I decided to go special forces. So yeah, I've, I've been through the, we're going to promise you everything and give you what we want to give you. Yeah. And, and looking back, you wouldn't trade a bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. I'd, I'd keep it just like it was. So no ranger school, but what, what were the enduring lessons? Cause as, as we move forward and we start talking about other stuff, I mean, we're always building on top of our foundations and what was the foundational leadership style or lessons that, that you learned at West Point? First and foremost, you learn that you can overcome almost any obstacle. You can, you're there, you have more strength inside you than you, than you know. You know, West Point was pretty hard, particularly early on. And you also learn that um, no matter how good you are as an individual, you're always better when you have good teammates around you. And and that really you you bond with those close to you that have got like-minded goals and, and uh, visions of their future. And you and you collectively figure out how to get whatever the obstacle in your path is. How do you how do you surmount? It? No matter how good you individually think you are at anything. You need to reach around and find out who else can help because you'll always build a, a better product, a better idea, come up with better solutions if you if you work the collective. And that's really the ethos of the special forces team, right? It's a, a, a collection of a dozen guys who all have a whole bunch of different skills and experiences by both training and, and, and role who collectively form an incredible thinking machine to overcome complex problems. Okay. So you graduate and you're, you're say 22. What's your mindset at that time? When was it? 1983? 1983. So, you know, I graduated from West Point, um, you know, had some, some really good mentors there. Uh, tactical officer, Major Wagner, who was a Vietnam veteran who influenced many of the graduating seniors in our company that, uh, that the right way to go was the infantry. And, uh, and we did. So I went, went from there, eventually did, uh, you know, the infantry basic course eventually did ranger school. That's another story. I didn't get there right after basic, but uh, bottom line is eventually got there in, in short order and, and served my initial tour in the 82nd Airborne, you know, be a power trooper, you know, jump out of planes. And, and, and honestly, uh, given the mature decision making of a 20 year old or 22 year old infantry men at that time, you know, I went to the 82nd because my buddies and I figured that if anything was going to happen anywhere, the 82nd would go and we want it to be wherever the action was. Alpha Company second to the 04. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started out in, uh, in Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 508th. And while I was there, we transitioned to become the 3rd Battalion of the 504th ah. uh, Infantry. Uh, did a little bit of time both in, in, as I said, in C Company, then in Headquarters Company as a scout platoon leader. But had a little bit over three years there. Great, great years Spent a lot of time on alert, waiting for the big the big call to come. Got as far as the uh, Pope Air Force Base a couple times, but never really got to do anything all that exciting operationally, which was one of my decision factors in uh, in deciding to go to Special Forces after going through the Infantry Advance Corps. So how is your, your leadership style kind of evolving? Because, you know, my perspective is only on the Special Forces side, where you've got these really strong non-commissioned officers, of which I was not one. I was, they were my mentors. You know, I was new. There you have young captains showing up. But the, the concept is the same, right? Everywhere across the Army, you have the officers and the enlisted. And the wealth of knowledge, the, the kind of the tribal knowledge exists in, in so many ways with the NCOs. And then they're kind of grooming the officer, but the officer's in charge. So what was that dynamic like as a, as a young officer? Yeah, I had a really interesting experience because, you know, I spent four years at, at West Point uh, listening to our, our 
tactical officers and instructors who are generally all officers. There's, there's much a higher percentage of NCO involvement now at West Point, which I think was needed, but but very limited contact with NCOs except during our summer programs. Because you know you do academics during the year, and then every summer you've got some kind of summer military training program. Airborne school, go spend six weeks with a, a tactical unit. Did mine in Hawaii with the 25th. So you get a little bit of contact, but you don't really know what you're getting until you're actually a platoon leader in a unit. And so I got to the 82nd, having been told, rely on your, your platoon sergeant, your squad leaders, they're going to be the quality guys you need. And uh, I entered kind of a an interesting time. We were still had some some holdovers from the from the draft army of the 70s and some of that, you know, the challenges of the 70s still lingering on. And, uh, and then some fired up young E5s that in many ways were, uh, were everything I had been told my E6s and E7. So it was kind of an interesting dynamic um, where you had the best NCOs in my platoon when I started out were actually E5s. And, and my squad leaders were somewhat, in some cases, not all, somewhat of a challenge. So it was an interesting dynamic. And, and so where I thought I was going to kind of walk into a, hey, I can trust this core of, of senior NCOs, it was really more of, okay, I'm going to have to do a little more work. And the guys I figured out that I really could trust and let run with the ball were those junior E5 team leaders. Uh, it was just, isn't it, you know, and that was one man's experience. I know others had different, but but it was just this army in transition that still had some of the draft army hangover and hadn't yet fulfilled the promise of what we wanted to be as a fully professional all volunteer force with an NCO corps that was the envy of you know the world's armies and what we could develop with our NCOs. So how did you sort of navigate that? specifically as a leader, because I think there's a lot of people out there that have, that have seen that because there's this perception, oh, there's, there's rank in the military. You just tell someone what to do and it happens. And it's not true. And you can always order someone to do it, but you've got to figure out by some means how to get your team the, the direction that you want to go. And so how do you navigate it when you've got someone who's kind of a, an impediment to that? You know, you always have that, no matter how good the collective is, they'll always have people in positions that, that might not be everything you'd want them to be. And sometimes you find out that they've got juniors on, in the wiring diagram that are more capable than, than the person that's been put in there by position. And uh, the, the way I've always handled it is to try and figure out, assuming, assuming you can work with the person, right? I mean, if, if somebody's really incompetent, frankly, there's only you know two choices. One, you train them and try and make them better. And if that fails, you remove them and, and they move on. But assuming that, that you can work with them, my technique was really to kind of counsel that leader by position to help them understand that they would really be better served relying on the full range of assets underneath them, and they'd be collectively more successful. You know, hey, have you thought about letting your team leader develop the training concept for this next week's worth of training rather than you do it all yourself? You know, I think it'd be really a great way to help develop Sergeant Smith if he was able to take this ball and run with it a little bit. And you just kind of supervise them and, and keep them between, you know, left and right limits. So, you know, kind of kind of guide them to the, the idea and make it their own idea that not only is it going to help them personally succeed, but it also helped this junior leader. And really what you're trying to tell them is, hey, Sergeant Smith's going to be way better at this than you are. So why don't you lean on him? You don't want to be that overt. And, so much of this is situational. To me, part of it is understanding the people you're dealing with, in, and most of them want to, want to succeed one way or another. And so, in a case like this, is how do I how do I define for them that the best way they can succeed is to push more responsibility on their junior leadership? What a great training venue for you in preparation to go to special forces. <laughs> And work with indigenous personnel around the world. Yeah, not to mention uh, working with the disparate personalities on the average SFA team. <laughs> it's a motley crew that we that we attract. I mean, some of the guys on my team were always like, you know, this is for our guys that hate the army but love America. I mean, stuff like that. There was always some take on it, right? Because you've got all these rebellious types that just want to, 
you know, my beard looks awesome. I can't shave it. Even when I come back to Garrison, I just want to keep my beard. It's like, man, it's, it's the army, right? You got to kind of play by some of the rules some of the time. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that is, in many ways, that is the nature of who we recruit to be a, a Green Beret because we are looking for somebody with a different set of mental approaches to problem solving. Um, who are willing in many ways to let an indigenous partner be the lead and, and have to work through guiding them to a solution. So it's their solution and, and they're doing most of the heavy lifting as opposed to us. Hey, I always tell people it's much easier to do this yourself. It's much easier to do a, a mission in Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere in Africa with a bunch of great Americans, right? Because the U.S. Army is disciplined. They follow orders, they're trained, they're smart, they're educated. Average Army Battalion, 4th Infantry are, are phenomenal Americans who can get a job done. It's harder to do the same kind of thing for the nation through somebody else's indigenous military or paramilitary, even sometimes a group of civilians who just don't like their government and we have aligned goals. It's harder to operate that way, but sometimes it's the right way to operate. And when it is, you need a group of guys that generally populate SFA teams who are willing to work in that much more difficult modality. What was it that attracted you then to, to special forces? I, I, I'm getting the sense you're, you were looking for the front lines, right? Yeah. And, and it's the mid 80s, mid to late 80s. And so there's not a whole lot of front lines. It's not exactly post 9-11. It's, it's a different time. Yeah, I, I will tell you that... Uh, it, I was looking for the front line. I wanted to find the action somewhere. I, I grew up, um, you know, kind of with the World War II generation. My dad had been too young for that. He joined in uh, the Army Air Corps in 1947 at the age of 17 and was in the Army of Occupation in, in Japan and then got out like a week before stop law for Korea. But I had uncles that had been in the Marine Corps. My granddad was in World War One, So I had that kind of background from a family perspective, but I grew up reading books. I, I you know, read everything in the library on the Civil War, on World War II. I wanted to serve the nation, and I was probably a little bit uh, caught up in, you know, young man's uh, desire for glory in combat kind of thing, which is a ridiculous, you know, you're looking back, you look like, how could I, how could I have had that mentality? It makes no sense once you've seen it. But, but I had that, and then, uh, you know, I, I had read Robin Moore's The Green Berets, as a, as a young teenager. And frankly, I've read that book probably, I don't know, half a dozen times over the course of my, my youth because I kept coming back to it. And of course, you know, the quintessential Hollywood movie, John Wayne and the Green Berets. I mean, between those, those two, how could you not want to be a Green Beret? I, I watched that movie the night before I reported to Special Forces Training Group at Fort Bragg. <laughs> And as I walked out of the theater, I wondered, what in the hell have I gotten myself into? Yeah, I mean, everyone's got those stories, right? I mean, there's something about Hollywood and, and I mean, you got to get inspiration from somewhere. I was reading all that stuff right after 9-11, trying to figure out where to go, watching Jason Bourne movies, figuring out Jason Bourne was a Green Beret before he was in the agency. So I guess I got to start there. I mean... And then you make it through and you realize that you literally haven't done anything because you show up and the, you're surrounded by Green Berets. You got what you wanted, which is this extra special community. And then you're, you're into the sort of iron sharpens iron and that's your way of life. And so what was that like for you? Because I, I know that's going to lead to some some of the operational assignments. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the Q course, as you know, is uh, somewhat of an ordeal. Uh, a test of both uh, physical and mental strength. Uh, and frankly, you know, I went through a much shorter version uh, than what we have today. Uh, and, and in many ways, I look at, it, at the today's course and say, wow, this is, this is incredibly harder than, than I had to do, Mo much more demanding. And, uh, and frankly, we put out a, a much better product today than we did back in my day. And a lot of that's a function of what we've learned uh, in requirements downrange. But uh, you know, I, I reported to my first assignment. I wanted to actually go to uh, seventh group in Panama. I had been down to Panama with my battalion in the 82nd for three weeks of jungle course, you know, watching the news, this was, uh, you know, 87, early 88. You knew that Panama was, was boiling. I figured that was the most likely spot. Plus seventh group 
at the time was the hot corner. There was a lot of things going on in, in Central and in, in South America, Colombia. You know, we had uh, uh, problems with Nicaragua, et cetera. So, you know, in that idea of where is the hot corner, at that point, it was seventh group. And so that's where I wanted to go. I had studied German, however, all through uh, junior high, high school, a little bit at West Point, and, and that made it onto my, my uh, West Point transcript. And so the branch detailer looked at that and said, yeah, we understand your desire to go to the, the seven special forces group in Panama. However, you're going to Betolz, Germany. Uh, and so instead of going and fighting the narco wars, et cetera, in, in, uh, in Panama, I got to go to the Betolz, Germany and get ready for the Cold War. All of which sort of went away, obviously, in the you know, fall of the Soviet Union. You know, I was there for the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and that whole thing. That was kind of interesting historically. And then, of course, right after that, relatively close in time, Saddam Hussein uh, invades uh, Kuwait, and every everything starts getting focused on the Middle East. I went off and did uh, an assignment with a, an, an interagency partner for my piece of Desert Storm. Uh, got back to my unit in time to re to deploy again to go do refugee operations with Kurds up in northern Iraq, southern Turkey. Uh, for all these refugees that had in the post-conflict had been chased uh, chased out of northern Iraq because they rose up against Saddam. So that was my first introduction to northern Iraq and the Kurds. My, the prelude to what we would be doing for the really the, a lot of my career in the Middle East. What specifically? I mean, you're you're now in charge of applying the lessons that you've you've learned. First Gulf War. I mean, there's it's still a war. It's it's you mentioned in in Seventh Group or Central America a lot of the places that. I think Rich was down there. He, he, he was holding watch for you down there. <laughs> but, you know, transitioning to 10th group, the originals, by the way, the, you know, the first special forces group, chronologically anyway, that, that there was. What was it like to kind of find yourself, shoot, when, when the wall falls and then quickly transitioning to, to the Middle East? When did the rubber hit the road for you? Yeah, you know, actually, I think the rubber hit the road really the first first day I got there. I mean, we I joined a, a team in, in A Company, 1st Battalion, that was in the midst of a pretty heavy training schedule. All of it was focused on wartime readiness. There was no doubt that the, the premier threat to the U.S. was still the Soviet Union right up until the day it all fell apart. It was very much our sole focus. I mean, once again, I go back to that story I told you about being willing to, to go back through SEER school with my team to make sure we were ready for whatever we were asked for in our wartime mission. You know, when, when you open that, that, uh, that war plan and, and you look and say, holy cow, we're going where to do what? We, we better get ourselves ready, you know? And I'm not sure I'm personally ready to do all the things necessary to do that. And certainly I got to figure out if this team can do that. I think that I think it's an eye opener. No matter what group you're going to, in what era, when you get to the team and you realize what is asked of you, what's already on the, the schedule for deployment in these in this day and age, or what might be asked of you, it's an eye opener. And as as much as the course focuses on getting a green beret applicant to the point where they are capable of doing the task. I'm not sure anything gets you in that mindset until you really put your first foot in a team room that says, holy cow, this is real. People are going to ask me to do hard things, some of which may be in incredibly dangerous places. And that's, I think, when it really becomes more than just the uh, the nice shoulder patch and the fancy headgear. Yeah. So everyone wants to be a Green Beret till it's time to do Green Beret shit, right? When was the sort of first pucker factor high for you? Probably. I mean, it was, you know, in retrospect, it was kind of minor pucker factor. Uh, but at that point, it was, you know, all we had. So uh, I guess, the, the you know, the first one as a Green Beret was, or as a, you know, in with my Green Beret counterparts is uh, we were doing uh, refugee operations in, a, like I said, in northern Iraq, southern Turkey. And, and we were at that point in time where we'd be on the ground long enough that we had sort of grown a little bit complacent. Everybody had. Uh, it was a refugee operation, right? We were feeding the Kurds giving them vaccines and shots and trying to make sure people don't die. And, and, uh, and we're all kind of sitting around after dinner one night around a campfire um, when all of a sudden the rounds start impacting in the camp from, from the nearby hillside. And uh, it turns out it's a bunch of PKK terrorists who were, sh were shooting at the Turkish camp right near us. They actually didn't 
you know, have anything against the Americans there, but we were, you know, very closely located with the Turkish battalion. And so, you know, when the rounds start impacting in and around your campfire, that's probably the first time I think it really, you know, you really realize it's real. I mean, you know, nobody got hit. Fortunately, their marksmanship wasn't any better than the Turks who tried to <laughs> fire back with mortars and took 35 minutes for a mortar mission. But uh, uh, in the end, it was enough to kind of reorient us and make sure we all knew that no matter where you are, no matter what the mission seems to be, it can all go south in a heartbeat. You never know what's lurking out there. Yeah, I, in my later years, I used to tell folks, uh, you know, I was a use of SOC commander, and I did a fair amount of uh, community engagement stuff as we were trying to explain, hey, what does your army soft do for you around the world? And you know, I talk about the fact that we're in 70 some odd locations around the world. And obviously everybody knew about Afghanistan and Iraq. I said, you know, and, but the other 68 are not club men. The types of places that Green Berets go, I mean, it's, it's kind of everywhere. I mean, you, you get your group assignment. It's kind of like playing the lottery. You don't know where you're going to go. You don't know what exactly you're going to face. I mean, how is it that, you know, you were in the first Gulf War refugee relief operations in Northern Iraq, you know, and then we're talking about non-combatant evacuation operations in Sierra Leone, a different continent. And peacekeeping operations in Bosnia. I mean, what is it that makes our community uh, adaptable to just the full spectrum of, of what that is? Like, what's the secret sauce? Well, I, you know, in theory, I mean, ideally we train for a region and, and get the chance to learn a, a language that's appropriate to the region, the culture, et cetera. Uh, and so the groups are regionally aligned. But, you know, the, obviously the Middle East has consumed all of special forces over the course of the years, just because of the immense size of the requirement. Um, but, but really the question I think you're asking is, so what makes a Green Beret able to kind of range through that, that spectrum of everything from a humanitarian operation up to leading indigenous forces in a high-end combat? I think the answer really starts with the people we select, and we have a very rigorous vetting process to try and select people who are mentally agile. In essence, I mean, obviously, we've spent a lot of time on physical things. Can you can you carry a rucksack? Can you meet these physical requirements? But I personally think that the real key ingredient to what we're looking for in a Green Beret is somebody who's a mentally agile, complex problem solver that can go into any environment we put them in with a minimal of guidance and left and right limits and figure it out. And generally, we don't give them a whole lot of resources other than what they bring with them, mostly in their mind, to figure it out. And that's why the, the A-team concept is I'm giving you a broad set of skills in a variety of areas that I think might be applicable to a lot of different environments. And you at the team level figure out how to mix and match this capability set, drawing on all the experiences and training you've had over time to figure out how to solve a problem. What are the lessons in just how to how to build an organization or structure an organization or provide guidance and intent that anyone could learn from Green Berets? Some might argue that this is no different than the, the rest of the army, but I, I I think for me the key of what what we do inside Special Forces, frankly, is is we operate inside a broad intent issued by a leader. In other words, I, I designate a task and purpose, or I'm given by my commander a task and purpose. I need you to accomplish, accomplish these things for these reasons in, as part of supporting the overall effort that we're involved in. And then we, we let the folks that have their lives on the line in doing that activity actually come up with the how. When we were doing the invasion for, uh, for Northern Iraq, our piece of the invasion uh, in 2003, I love using this example because uh, it, it really uh, exemplifies this idea of, of task and purpose and not being dictated to how of something. Uh, I was a battalion commander in 10th group, so lieutenant colonel. My boss was the group commander, Charlie Cleveland, Colonel Cleveland at that time. We got told by our high, higher headquarters, the Theater Special Operations Command, basically, U.S. is going to invade Iraq. Your job is to go up in the north with the Kurds and contribute to the campaign. I mean, it was probably a little more formal than that, but that's about what it boils down to. Go north, accomplish things. And literally on a Saturday morning, after having had a chance to study the problem, 
the battalion commanders and the operations officers and our senior NCOs kind of sat in the group headquarters basement on a Saturday morning. Cause really only the, we know in the military, our best work always happens on a weekend. Absolutely. Sat in that basement and, and essentially looked at the overall situation and said, what are we going to do up there? What do we, what do we need to do? What do we need to accomplish? And from that, we looked and said, okay, two thirds of the Iraqi army was up North arrayed against the Kurds and, and actually against Turkey. Hey, our job must be to keep that two thirds of the Iraqi army up North so that they can't interfere with the regular army driving and Marine Corps driving up from Kuwait into Baghdad. But all of that was derived by the guys on the ground and then we worked through how we were going to accomplish the task of keeping 13 Iraqi divisions staying in the north. That's different in a lot of ways than uh, the conventional military where not only you're told why you're doing it, but in many ways you're kind of given it and here's how you're going to suck the egg. Okay, so let's get into to Viking Hammer a little bit then. Let, let's sort of set the stage a, a little bit more geopolitically with you know, the main players, right? So you've got army special forces in the North, y- you guys, you've got the, the Turks who have, they're, they're still debating in Congress, whether we can use their airspace. You've got the Kurds who people, people hear a lot about the Kurds, but wh- who, who are the Kurds, right? I mean, Kurdistan cu- cuts across a lot of borders. You know, we, the Western world sort of drew some lines way back when, and they're not really fully recognized by everyone, including the Kurds. And, and then you've got this idea of you need to keep these Iraqi divisions decisively engaged to some extent or neutralized, whatever that ends up being, so that the main effort, a.k.a. go take Baghdad, can, can succeed. How hard could that be? It's not exactly simple. Yeah, no, and, and, uh, and actually, when you, and then when you dig into it, it becomes even more complex because uh, when you look at the Kurds, we tend to, particularly these days, we look at it and we say the Kurds and we assume this monolithic uh, grouping in that, in that geography. And the real, reality was even then, so there were two, two Kurdish political parties uh, that had split control of northern Iraq. The party I ended up working with, the PUK, had kind of the eastern portion butting up against the Iranian border. And uh, the KDP, the second battalion I was working with, was in the, the east. Western sector. Uh, these are groups that don't like each other. Um, they have literally fought at one point. In fact, uh, in about 96, I think it was, the KDP invited and worked with Saddam's troops to push the PUK further east. Uh, so, so there's a lot of bad blood. But in general, they've been fighting. At one point, my uh, main counterpart, Jalal Talabani, uh, who went on to be the president of Iraq for many years, said, you know, you need to understand I've been fighting this war for the freedom of my people since 1961, the year you were born. So this has been an ongoing struggle for the Kurds for decades, uh, but they have some internal challenges. They don't like each other. There's another group up there, the PKK, who neither of the two political groups in Iraq likes, uh, and they're primarily focused on, on uh, stirring up trouble inside Turkey which is why the Turks have a presence inside Northern Iraq at this point. A, a, an existence that has been kind of eked out by the Kurds in Northern Iraq based on the fact that after the Gulf War, we imposed a no-fly zone on Northern Iraq to get all the Kurds out of Turkey, the ones that I had been helping back in 91 in refugee camps. You know, 10th Group got deployed in total up there to run refugee camps. To get them back out of Turkey, we had decided that we would be the, the West would fly a no-fly zone. And had, that had been going on since 91 up until the invasion. And under that umbrella of mo- a modicum of safety, um, the Kurds had, had built a society for themselves. But, you know, the, uh, the Iraqis were also embargoed on exports other than the oil for food program. Well, to get around the oil for food program, the Iraqis were exporting oil or a black market oil up to Turkey. But all of that ran through the KDP sector. And so the KDP was making money hand over fist on black market and oil going into Turkey. So they liked the status quo. They were fine with Saddam in power. And so, you know, when you then say, okay, how are we going to, you know, use the Kurds or empower the Kurds to be part of this invasion? You really have a couple different sets of Kurds. 
PUK not happy with the situation because they're not getting any oil revenue. So they figure they can only do better by the U.S. getting involved. Oh, by the way, they have this terrorist problem off on their eastern side in Halabja with uh, Ansar al-Islam. So they're in a pretty weak position. Uh, you know, Ansar al-Islam is running suicide bombers into their capital in Suleimania. They've got a tenuous uh, relationship with the KDP, the other Kurdish party who's getting stronger by the day on, on black market oil money, and they're getting weaker. So it's a really weird dynamic. And, and of course, there's a bunch of other minority groups that all you know have their own interests in play in. But that's kind of the macro picture, if you will, of, of the mess we're going into. And of course, you know we're going in uh, into an area where ostensibly it's what we would call semi-permissive. We've got these friends, the Kurds, who are sort of in control of their territory, but at least the sector I was in, we did have this problem with Ansar al-Islam, which was uh, an al-Qaeda-affiliated terrorist group that was running ops into this, quote, safe territory, which also had Iraqi agents in the area. And we were under, uh, you know, we assume, threat of, of, uh, of an Iraqi uh, spoiling attack. They did have two-thirds of their army, as I mentioned, aligned in this almost World War One style line along what they call the Green Line separating Peshmerga forces and Saddam's army. And so we, we expected that when we got there, one of the options that the Iraqis would do would be basically to come north with their tanks. So um, given all that, it was somewhat of a complex situation. So how do you go from the 10th Group headquarters in Fort Carson, Colorado, in the basement on a Saturday, to boots on the ground, to sort of seeing that plan come to fruition. What, what does that look like for, for your leadership team and for your delegation style and for the way that you, you spread that message out to the guys that are, that are about to go into combat? Yeah, so we had a long run up. So when I, you know, I talk about the, uh, the meeting in group headquarters, that's probably spring of, uh, of 02, right? So we don't really, the invasion doesn't play out until uh, March of 03. So we had uh, quite a bit of time to do a pretty detailed planning effort. You know, first of all, we developed our, our sort of macro plan for the, for the battalion. Of course, it was all based on a set of assumptions. Uh, we're based in Turkey. We had an idea that we were going to have a combination of flying teams in to a, an airfield, but also driving a lot of guys from Turkey just right across the border into northern Iraq. Uh, we had this great, clever plan, and we spent a lot of time with the teams assigning them their specific missions along the green line with the with Kurdish counterparts that we were getting some pretty good intel on with the idea that you know we would have to deal help the Kurds deal with this Ansar al-Islam problem because that's where their main focus was to help them reorient on Iraqi forces and then working with the teams we would first be prepared to defend because the the greatest uh, threat we saw was was the Iraqi army attacking north and then to be able to move south once we developed some combat power had air support etc to try and push Saddam's army uh, back and, and as I said to just try and make sure that they didn't reposition and defend Baghdad against the the uh, major forces coming out of Kuwait so that was the plan we spent a lot of time with with uh, you know at the team level guys developing their piece of that back briefing to the command leadership, to myself, my, my ops officer, my command sergeant major. And then we would train against all the different tasks we thought we would have to execute in order to be able to survive the environment and execute the plan. A lot of time on the chemical weapons defense. We were convinced we were going to get hit with chem. We, like many others, were pretty confident Saddam had chemical weapons and that we were going to be the target. So all of those things you're juggling, how much time do I spend on all these? And then we spent a fair amount of time just trying to understand the culture, understand the society, because you know one of the things uh, I told my guys is, hey, we're going to have to invest in understanding you know, the kind of the human terrain here, because once the war is over, we're going to be there and left with figuring out how to help put it all back together until the Iraqis can take take control and we can leave. And that might be weeks, it might be months, it might be years, but we need to start now to study and understand. So we brought a couple of university professors in who kind of gave us the history of, of Iraq and the Middle East from you know when the earth cooled. And, uh, and we spent some time trying to learn some Arabic, some Kurdish, et cetera. The guys didn't enjoy that quite as much as, as dropping bombs and shooting guns. <laughs> um, I had a few guys tell me later, 
that it was probably the time most well spent. All right. So, you, you, I mean, this is a big operation. You're, you're invading Iraq, right? I mean, it's, it's a big effort. And, and if you lived through this, this was a really big deal. You know, I mean, we're already in Afghanistan. We're pulling a lot of resources to invade Iraq. I mean, you're given an order that this is happening. Nobody's asking your opinion on this, just, just like they weren't asking mine. I mean, I, you know, at a personal level, I signed up after 9-11 to go to Afghanistan because I wanted to be the guy hunting bin Laden, right? I mean, that's, it's like that, that's the movie I saw and that's what I wanted to go do. And, and yet, you know, you, you go do what you're, what you're told to do and you want to do it to the best of your abilities. And when you're there and, and you're about to send all these guys into battle, yes, you've trained. Yes, this, this is what everyone trained for. I mean, what's that feeling like? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the end, as a commander, you're responsible for everybody inside the organization and uh, to include their families, making sure that, uh, you know, if, if something goes wrong and we lose guys, you know, we've, we've trained people to, to notify them, to take care of them, to kind of ease that, that pain. Um, but you know that, it, that I, when we deployed to Iraq, I was confident that we had done everything we could to get ourselves ready. We had had the luxury of, of time. I was very happy that, you know, and how we used it. But in the end, I was also pretty sure that we wouldn't all be coming home. And that the responsibility for that would in some ways rest on, on me. Did I do everything I could to get them ready? Um, had, we, had we done and spent our time on the right things? Um, you spend some time thinking about that. But I personally spent more time thinking about those kind of things early on as I put effort into what we were going to do to get the unit ready to go. Because you know, when you're getting on the planes to deploy, it's a little too late at that point. It's... Uh, it's it's not worthy time to second guess. You, at that point, you're either you've done everything you can or you haven't. But I was, you know, it was we were going into a dangerous situation. There was no doubt in my mind, and uh, and I I knew we'd be damn lucky to to bring everybody home, and I didn't think we'd be that lucky. In the end, we were that time. Yeah. So so let's hear about how that specific operation went. So you know, I told you we had this clever plan. We were going to uh, drive out and fly out of Turkey. Uh, in the end, of course. Um, you know, the assumption that the Turks were going to give us uh, basing and overflight failed to, to pan out. Actually, it, we had kind of started out as a fact, you know, hey, Turks told the Turkish military told us they'd give us basing. Uh, over time, it became apparent that their political masters had different ideas. So it kind of changed to an assumption. And eventually the assumption proved false. Uh, and uh, we ended up, instead of basing out of Turkey, we based out of Romania. You know, I had to figure out how we were going to get to, from Romania or into or Iraq, rather, northern Iraq, without overflying Turkey. You know, it's a whole other story, but bottom line is we had gotten some guys into northern Iraq some period of time before, incrementally, and uh, to include, uh, by early March, myself and my ops officer and about a company's worth of SF guys total uh, across both sectors. I had about a half a company. Uh, the other battalion commander had a, a half of his company. We got in there in early March uh, by other means, and then... Uh, in, in essence, the war started with most of the group still back in Romania, uh, trying to figure out how we were going to get him in. You know, if, every night for about a week, we got promised tonight we're going to be able to get overflight, and uh, we'd we'd have our Kurds down at our unimproved landing strip there near Suleimania, uh, and have all thousands of Kurds out there to secure the strip, and then we'd get the radio message that said, you know, nobody tonight. Uh, can't get overflight. And that went back and forth for about four days. And then for us, the war really started with the cruise missile strike down in Halabja uh, against this, this Ansar al-Islam uh, target, that, uh, this, this Al-Qaeda affiliated group, somewhere between 900 and 1,000 guys that were holding a piece of terrain along the Iranian border near the, town, uh, the Iraqi town of Halabja. Uh, it had turned into essentially a Kind of a World War I stalemate of their trenches and the Kurdish trenches. And so on, on the night of, I guess, 21 March, uh, the few of us that were in, all, in at that time were, were down in the Halabja area uh, on the roof of a battalion headquarters, Kurdish battalion headquarters, waiting for the, the cruise missiles to come in. Our initial plan was cruise missiles were going to hit, and then the next morning we were going to attack. But of course, with the battalion still sitting in Romania, uh, we postponed that attack. You know, we were supposed to get something like 70 cruise missiles 
in five minutes from midnight to five minutes after midnight after about two hours of waiting and no cruise missiles. And of course, at this point, I've promised my Kurdish counterparts every night for about a week that we'll have a battalion of SF guys that never showed. Uh, we'd have planes loaded with weapons that hadn't flown in yet. And now I had promised them that we were going to have 70 cruise missiles hit their dire enemy, the uh, Ansar al-Islam, between midnight and five after. About two hours into waiting for the first missile strike, one of my NCOs comes up and says, Hey, sir, you know that point in the Q course where they tell you you've lost rapport with your indigenous counterpart <laughs> and you have to go into E&E, &E, evasion and escape? <laughs> I said, yeah, I, I remember that scenario. So are we there yet? And, and are, are we really going to run to Turkey? Because that was our evasion plan when they won't even give us overflight and basing. And I was like, trust me, man, the missiles are coming. We just have the timing wrong or something. And sure enough, about uh, 45 minutes later, the first cruise missiles sputtered in within the first couple of strikes we must have hit an ammo dump because you know the secondary explosions were phenomenal the Kurds were cheering and and all sins were forgiven all all lost you know broken promises were uh, were forgiven and they were convinced that indeed we might be as powerful as uh, as they uh, they thought we were um, and then within a, i think the next night or two we uh the group had decided rather than continue to wait for, for overflight, Colonel, Colonel Cleveland and, and his deputy, who was the Air Force Colonel Wing Commander, uh, made the decision to fly the group to Jordan on one night. And then on the subsequent night, they flew, I think it was seven MC-130 loads of, of SF guys for 2nd and 3rd Battalion into Northern Iraq. And so you know, the next night I had myself and uh, our advanced parties sitting around a, this unimproved script as we as we received, I think, a total of four MC-130 spaced out over 45 minutes of guys who flew a long route from Jordan to northern Iraq under a very heavy fire. One, one, every, every plane got engaged to some level. One was shot up so badly for a for second battalion that they had to actually they were given permission to do an emergency landing in Turkey, uh, but they were really significantly shot up. So we almost on night, you know, on the night of infill, we almost lost a C-130 with probably 80 Americans inside. Certainly would have put a different face on the, on the war up north for sure. The war in general, I think. Uh, but, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, uh, in landing those aircraft, Every guy I got a chance to talk to as they came off talked about the experience and, you know, floating in air as the Air Force did a phenomenal job. Uh, low level, nap of the earth, missiles flying through the air, anti-aircraft fire shooting up at them. More than, more, than a, more than a few guys found God that night. And I'm not kidding. Um, and, uh, and it was just an amazing thing. One other little story from Infill, you know, like I said, I didn't, I didn't experience it because I got in by other means, was there to receive them. But we had war game what the Iraqis might do. And one of them was uh, we, this airfield was surrounded by high ground. And we thought uh, Iraqi special operations forces were probably up on the high ground and could bring mortar fire or rocket fire in on us. And uh, I think in between the second and third lifts, you know, we bring these guys in, all their equipment, all these guys just been through this hiring experience. We throw them on trucks. And, and take them off to the compound nearby where we were going to marshal them before we pushed them out to the front lines. And so we did just pushed off a truck, a couple of truckloads of, uh, air, of lift two, I think. And all of a sudden there's this double boom, boom, a couple seconds later, another big explosion. And of course, all the Americans are well drilled on the contingency of if we're under attack, we're going to leave here quickly and we're going to meet at this old concrete plant. And of course, you know, one of my guys runs up, sir, Give me a word. Are we going? It's like, okay, get in the vehicles. Let's get out of here. We're under attack. And then over the radio, one of the Kurds is talking. My counterpart comes up and says, no, no, it's no, no problem. No problem. What do you mean it's no problem? Oh, we had a small problem with an RPG. Well, I find out later the small problem is they had a, a negligent discharge with a, a, an RPG-7 anti-tank rocket that literally in one of the security vehicles, the guy pickles off his RPG accidentally. It bounced in the road right behind our truckload of our guys and then kind of skittered off and exploded off the side of the road. So, you know, it was just a night of good luck, frankly. You know, God was on our side. They didn't shoot down an airplane. And uh, and, and we didn't manage to get killed by our Kurdish counterparts shooting RPGs at the trucks <laughs> by accident. So 
<laughs> in the end, we got a good chunk of the battalion in that night. And then uh, that allowed us to put some of our teams forward on the green line, working with their Kurdish counterparts, and then uh, putting uh, primarily C Company, but also a team from B Company that had already been in working with the, the Kurds to, to kind of do the final plan and conditions in Halabja for the attack against Ansar al So one of the things that's counterintuitive is that in matters of violence, it's actually safer to be on offense. That holds at the tactical level and the strategic level. When you have the, the momentum, you have to seize it. What did that look like when you have all these moving pieces? And, you know, the, the parentheses of, of the mission is called Ugly Baby because of the, the flight pattern that the guys had to take around Turkey. And it just, you know, that looks like an ugly baby, right? Nothing's going perfectly, right? I mean, nothing ever goes perfectly. And, and the world kind of rewards leaders and you want to be around the leaders that can just adapt because it's never going to go perfectly. And, and so what did it look like? You know, you've got this initial sort of shock and awe sort of, and, and then the evolution into maintaining or seizing that momentum and, and pushing it forward. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think uh, we all who have been in the military understand, you know, that plans are nothing, planning is everything, right? I mean, it never goes according to plan. You know, we were supposed, we had, I, I, I failed to mention we had actually bought a, our, our vehicle support was supposed to be a fleet of brand new Land Rovers that we had bought new out of England and shipped to a port in Turkey. So they were locked up there. So literally, um, you know, we were begging and borrowing from the Kurds. At one point, we were buying vehicles that the Kurdish black market was stealing out of Baghdad so that we could then drive these uh, these old hoopties around as our tactical vehicles. And so, you know, we were putting teams in dump trucks and everything else to, to try and shuttle them around. And, and like I said, I mean, there's so many aspects of all the great planning we did for eight or nine months, none of which came to fruition. But it, it really comes down to the things that you the problems you think about and work through and the capabilities you create, you figure out how to use them on the ground. You know, so in this instance, uh, it, we didn't get there any way we thought we were gonna get there, but we got there. And once there, the guys understood task and purpose, right? Task and purpose for some of the teams was link up with their uh, Kurdish counterpart, get on the green line and start putting pressure as best we could on the Iraqi army to our front to accomplish the overall mission of keeping the Iraqis there. And then for a good part of the force, it was, hey, we got to take care of this Ansar Islam problem and eliminate these guys. One, because they're affiliated with our with uh, Al-Qaeda. You know, one of the guys that was uh, in the camp, at least for a portion of the time we knew from our intel, was a guy named uh, Musab al-Zarqawi mm. that we later came to know as the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq in, in subsequent years. But even at that point, we already knew he was a significant Al-Qaeda figure, figure. And so from an emotional point of view, you know, you had a whole bunch of guys who didn't get to go to Afghanistan and get a little bit of payback for 9-11. But we knew that these guys over in Halabja, some of them were part of the group Al-Qaeda and some of them you know, wanted to do things like Al-Qaeda had done. And so there was, there was, plenty of high desire to go and, uh, and take care of this problem that the Kurds had with this Al-Qaeda group. And so, you know, then it was once their guys were on the ground, it was just an opportunity. We, we had a plan. We had spent a lot of time with terrain models and everything else. And, and then we linked up with our Kurdish counterparts. And as had happened with everything else in the plan, it was, okay, we think this is the way you might want to do this. And they, and they came back with, yeah, that's not the way we work. And so we molded the best of what we had thought about it to what they thought about it and how they could integrate what we brought to the fight, which was supposed to be an all a whole bunch of air support. In the end, we didn't get nearly the air support we would like to have had. It was about as far away in northern Iraq or in Iraq as you could be from the supporting air elements. You know, we're up in that northeastern corner of Iraq. So we got some sorties and they were they were good when they came. But most part, the day was carried when we finally launched this assault about seven days after uh, the initial TLAM strike. It was, uh, you know, our, our Peshmerga counterparts with uh, AKs, a couple of magazines each, and, and SF Green Berets by their side, bringing in a little bit of air support, some mortar, mortar crews that we had put together inside C Company, and frankly, just some good tactics to 
to, to launch an assault in, in what is some pretty horrendous terrain, in significant mountain range in between Iraq and Iran at that point, and the uh, and SRO has long held most of the high ground. What was sort of a, a high point, if you will, something that someone did that worked for you that really impressed you? I will tell you one of the most impressive things in this was my counterpart, Jalal Talibani. So the uh, this enemy force that we were up against uh, in, along the Iranian border there was really a couple different groups. It was uh, Ansar al-Islam as kind of the, the coalescing uh, leading group of, of very uh, radical Salafist Muslim terrorists, but they had a couple of other political parties that had associated with them. And T- Talibani did a great job working his contacts and sources and basically helped us remove some of those supporting parties at the last minute, right before the battle. Now, one of them was helped by the fact that we targeted one of the groups with the T-LAM strike and took out about 100 of them on the night of the 21st in their barracks. Um, and so Talibani used that, you know, that weakness to basically negotiate them out of the fight. And then he used another, you know, some negotiating skills on another one, basically removed some of their combat power from them at the last moment. And so essentially think you're in a defensive, defensive position, and all of a sudden your left and right flank have been disappeared. You know, your, your allies are no longer your allies. And, and I thought that was pretty impressive. You know, here, here we are. We were going to do this essentially World War I style, straight up the middle attack up in this high ground. For us, it was how do we manipulate the tactics and the firepower and everything else. And he's working these political deals behind the, the, uh, the scenes to undermine his enemy and get him to the weakest point he can. I mean, he, he knew he couldn't do anything with Ansar al-Islam, the core. They were committed Salafis, but he knew his personality well enough that, that he knew he could leverage some other uh, human factors, if you will, and, and get them out of the fight. So... I thought that was pretty impressive. I mean, I know we also had a whole bunch of impressive young young Green Berets on the battlefield with Barrett 50 cals and, and uh, you know, assaulting up golf course-like terrain into the teeth of enemy machine gun pits. But from a you know, kind of a strategic perspective, Jalal Talibani was a pretty, pretty impressive man. So what's your, what's your kind of, AAR on the whole operation, which by the way, there, there's a book out there called Masters of Chaos. It's about how awesome Green Berets are and all the cool stuff that Green Berets do. And, and I encourage you, if you're, you're listening out there and you want to be a Green Beret, go, go test your metal. It's, it's an awesome way of life. This is one of the books that was, you, you read it and you think, oh, that's exactly what I want to go do. It talks a lot about this battle and and, and a lot of other stuff. So if, if you want to read up on some, some additional tactics and stuff like that, we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes, but it's, it's there to, to frame this. This is kind of a classic special forces mission by, with, and through, right? I mean, we're sending limited numbers of Green Berets into hostile territory. We're linking up with the local indigenous force to advise and assist us because they know the ground truth. They're the ones who are there, hey, you don't want to do that because of, you know, this. And they know because they they lived there before we showed up and they're going to live there if they're still living, right, A- after we after we leave. Certainly their, their clan will. And you're, you're in the invasion of, a, of Iraq and you don't lose anybody on that. And any Americans, I should say. I know, I know we, we lost some, some of our partner forces. Yeah, I think we lost, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, we lost... Uh... Three of our Kurdish counterparts uh, kill, I think, twenty some odd uh, wounded. Uh, which, which honestly, when you when you look at the terrain, is just a phenomenally low cost. When you're talking about uh, you know, this kind of defensive positions they had, the, the terrain on their side, but essentially it was you know about somewhere between seven, eight, nine thousand Kurds, probably sixty Green Berets working with them in little groups across the front. And, uh, you know, going up about eight, eight or nine hundred. And it sounds like great odds when you look at the terrain, you know, given the machine gun emplacements and everything else. Uh, we were very fortunate to, to get a, get away with no U.S. casualties and, and the, the limited Kurdish casualties. But as far as, you know, the takeaway, uh, to me, it was a classic Green Beret mission. It was how do we accomplish a significant U.S. objective 
Um, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about was one of the things that's what all Islam was doing was, was working on a chemical weapons production inside uh, their territories. In fact, it's one of the things that Colin Powell took to the United Nations as evidence of Iraqi uh, misbehavior. Uh, but so that was one of the things that was going on there. Th this was a group that even if you took the whole everything else with Iraq out of uh, out of the equation, was a group that wanted to do harm to U.S. and U.S. interests, much as Al Qaeda had. I mean, that's why they were, uh, you know, co-travelers in the movement, so to speak. And so we we were able to achieve a significant strategic blow against this group achieve U.S. objectives with really a very minimal U.S. commitment of capability. A few dozen Green Berets leveraging and, and influencing our Kurdish counterparts to do something that both supported their needs, but, but more importantly, supported what the U.S. wanted. And that's, that's kind of what Green Berets do, is how do we leverage indigenous mass or create indigenous mass to achieve effects for U.S. interests. All right. So, you know, at this point, you're a, you're a lieutenant colonel. You, you progress in your career significantly, right, to, to three-star general. Now, the perspective that comes from that is enormous, I'm sure. It, it always is, right? You get older, you get wiser, you see more. I mean, from what I've seen, special forces has become the kind of catch-all for all the problems. Like, oh, I'm just going to send in special forces. And, you know, as, as you take a step out and you start to look at the whole Department of Defense policies and what's the role of, of special forces, special operations, as it fits into our kind of, what, what should we be doing in a lot of these places? Because I don't think we want to have hundreds of thousands of troops deployed again, like we did in, in Iraq anytime soon. So we've seen kind of, this works really well with, with a, a small group of Green Berets and, and a local indigenous force? I mean, what are the limits of that? Well, I, I think in, in general, I'd say we always should default to providing an indigenous partner or ally the support they need to solve their own problems. The default mode should be what's the least amount of involvement in U.S. footprint to achieve our objectives in support of their objectives. And, and from a military perspective, for the military tasks that need to be done. Green Berets are, are well-designed to do a lot of that work, which is why we're in 70 plus countries on any given day, because we're really the only military force that selected, trained, recruited, and focused on working with an indigenous partner to do those kind of things. Everybody else is focused on closing with and destroying an enemy combatant force. We have a whole different approach, a whole different mindset. And so we're well suited to these, these environments where we're trying to help a partner solve their own problems. But I think it's important to recognize that in the places that we're doing that, we are not the only component of a solution. You know, when, when you look at a, a country that's got instability, it really it, it comes down to what are the root causes? Why is there instability? Is there social, social injustice? Is there economic imbalance, underdeveloped? You know, what, what are the challenges? And then the question is, are we willing to expend the resources to do that? Is it in our interest? And do our interests align well enough with the indigenous interests that we can achieve a common purpose for at least a period of time to work together to make the situation better? It's not the answer in all places. There are, there are places where there is nobody where our interests are aligned well enough or that we're willing to work with that we should be employed. So there are probably places it might seem like, hey, send some Green Berets there to work with their military and bring in some State Department and USAID and, uh, you know, we can we can make this a better place. But there are some places where that's just, that alignment isn't there. The partner isn't ready. And uh, and our efforts, we may want to change it, but it's just not going to happen. So I, I, I think it, it, it all starts with, hey, is it really important enough to send a Americans of any flavor, military, state, USAID, agency, uh, is it important to send Americans there? And is it any interest of the nation? And is there something we can reasonably be expected to achieve to make the situation better? And not every place comes out as a yes to all this. 
how much of this is kind of diplomacy as well? So when I was still working for you, right, at, at 10th Group, I, I got sent down to Mauritania. Uh, I've talked about it a little bit on this podcast in, in name only, but I mean, most people couldn't find that on a map if they were me before I was told I was going there, right? It's like, wait, show me again. Where, where is this? You know, it's just south of Morocco. It's Western Africa. It's, it's enormous, right? So, you know, they speak French there and, you know, and, and it's the Islamic Republic of, you know, we were there to train and, and assist their version of special forces, right? I mean, they were three hours outside of town in Akchut, Mauritania, and probably because they like to locate them out there so that it's hard for them to start a coup, which happened a little bit after we left. But what is the importance of diplomacy and rapport building and all of that stuff? And because to me, that's, that's special forces guys are teachers. Education is a huge part of it. And when it's time to go invade Northern Iraq, we're, we're going to go do that mission too. But what's the importance of why we're in so many countries maintaining these relationships and, and growing these relationships? Well, well, generally, if we're on the ground in a place, it's because of the, the higher level commands, either the, the Theater Special Operations Command, working with their boss, the four-star geographic combatant command, you know, in this case that you're talking about would be AFRICOM, has, has done an analysis of of what they've been told to do by the Department of Defense and, and, uh, and the president, essentially, of where national interests lie. Uh, you know, when, when you're in North and Northwestern Africa, you know, we were there because, you know, there was a, uh, a growing Salafist Islamic movement, terrorist movement. It's still there. It's what the French have been struggling against in Mali. Uh, that has an anti-Western component and is counter to Western interests. And so the, you know, the decisions made that, hey, we're gonna a apply hopefully a holistic application of diplomatic efforts, of aid efforts, and then a, and a military component. And that's the piece that you probably were doing there in Mauritania, you know, a piece of the military element to train their forces to do their job better, to support their government's fight against instability and, and what these Islamic terrorists are trying to, to do inside their society. And, and I would tell you that, you know, from my perspective, one of the things that come out of our presence there beyond what we'd call the material effect of making them better at their job is what I like to refer to as values transfer to some extent. Uh, the longer we spend working with indigenous counterparts, uh, my experience is that the more likely they begin to take on some of the moral aspects that, that we bring to this environment. You know, I, I looked at how we operated with the Iraqi Special Operations Forces. We had such a close relationship that over time, the way they operated in and amongst their society, how they treated their own civilian populace was far different than the rest of the Iraqi army. They were far more disciplined. They were you know, certainly more effective as a as a military force, but they just acted differently. They were, they understood human rights concerns. They understood that, you know, you don't kill prisoners, et cetera, et cetera. So part of, part of what we're doing when we work with our indigenous counterparts around the world is also help professionalize them and modernize them in some ways. Uh, but also this, this this idea of values transfer and help them be a better military inside their society. Let's take the kind of arc of your career and your leadership style and, and the ways that, that you as a, a Green Beret that's also taken a lot of billets and a lot of jobs along the way that you're not just a, a team leader, you're not just around Green Berets and compare yourself now to your, yourself when you get out of West Point. I mean, what sort of held true and, and where did you have to learn to, to bend a little bit here or there? I think I, the more I, I experienced and the more I, uh, I grew and got older, the, the more I realized how, how little I knew. I think probably as a, uh, as a young lieutenant coming out of West Point and then as a young captain out of the, out of the Q course, you know, I, I've, I may not have had all the answers, but probably thought I had most of them. But I, I, would, I would like to think that as, 
as time went on, I realized, particularly as you as you you're handed more and more complex decisions to make, situations to work through, that you gain a lot more humility over time, and you realize, I don't care who you are, none of us know it all. And, and the art of leadership, particularly the art of senior leadership, to me is figuring out the right people to connect with, and they don't all work for you. Um, you know, you, you network with others who's got, who have displayed good judgment, who have an area of expertise that you don't have. To me, it's really a, a, you know, the, the art of senior leadership is how do you build an understanding and a network of people that you can rely on and seek help from and counsel from? Because the world is, the world is a hard place. We are we live in complex times and it's been like that it's probably since you know man began. Life is hard, the world is hard, and, and none of us have all the tools we need to navigate some of these complex environments by ourselves. So you got to figure out how to how to be humble enough to ask and uh, and seek help from the right people. So what does that look like when you're younger though? So someone's out there, they're listening to this, they're they're about to start their first job. They don't have that wisdom yet. And and I mean, just you talking to yourself back then, I mean, because part of what makes it awesome to be young is that you, you think you have all the answers. And so you'll just, it doesn't matter. You're just like, send me. Like, I, I want to go because I have all the answers. And part of that is good, right? And yet, how do we learn a little bit faster how to, what controlled aggression looks like? <laughs> I, I'm laughing because uh, my older son is a, a Green Beret captain in Germany, and and I've I've tried over the course of my years to to do exactly what you're suggesting, which is how how does the old guy impart and accelerate the learning to the new guy, to the younger guy? Um, I honestly, you know, I'm a student of, of history, particularly military history, and I, I think that's been the age old search for for the old guys that survive in this profession where, you know, you, you try and figure out how do I, how do I translate all this stuff I've learned and experienced over the course of my life to keep some young guys alive a little bit longer and wake them up sooner to the fact that, uh, you know, don't go rushing and looking for it. Plenty of, plenty of violence and, and, and excitement will come your way, regardless of whether you go chase it. All you really need to do is get yourself as ready as you can for it when it comes your way. And, uh, and be careful what you ask for. I think it's really more, it's, it's less about the young guys because young guys are what young guys are, right? I mean, it's almost like we're hardwired genetically, which is why, you know, I used to say war is a young man's sport. You know, the, the 40 and 50 year old guys, they're not fighting to get on the next deployment. The 22, 24, 26 year old guys, they're all, they're all itching to go one more time. But I think it's, it's incumbent upon the old guys to try and, mentor, teach, transmit lessons, uh, and, and then realize that some of it's just, uh, maybe it's hardwired in the, in the human mind to, as a young, particularly as a young type A kind of guy that we get in the military to, to want to seek this out. And it's uh, hopefully they'll listen long enough to, to, to at least take on a few of the lessons so they survive long enough. To learn. I tend to think it's a responsibility and you're absolutely correct. I think it's a responsibility of the older to create introspection within the young ones, get them to look inside. And I think that's one of the things that, that to me drives a good special forces soldier is the ability to look introspectively at himself and determine what he's capable of and what he's not capable of. Example, first team I went to, team sergeant called me in. I was an E5 full of piss and vinegar. I was ready to conquer the world. And he called me in and he said, sit down. I want to talk to you. Every good warrior should be able to do this. You tell me what you can't do well. And I thought, well, I can do everything well. He said, I want you to look inside and tell me what you can't do well. And here's the reason for it. He said, I don't want to give you a mission or a requirement that you're going to fail at. That's number one, because you may get yourself killed and you may get other people on this team killed. Secondly, it tells me what I need to get you trained in and what I need to mentor you in and work you up as you progress through your career in special forces. 
and it didn't really hit me right then. But as I went back and sat around and drank a couple of beers and thought about it, that was probably the advice that followed me through 30 years in the Army. It wasn't, a, it, it wasn't a, a, an epiphany, but it was the start of looking inside myself and looking inside others around me as I became more capable of doing that and finding out what could and couldn't be done within me and within them. And then I knew what the team could do. Yeah, that's, that's great. I tell you, that's, uh, I think part of what we try and do throughout our training process, particularly in the, in the Special Forces Qualification course, is, is put folks in enough different, hard, complex situations that it forces them to do some of that self-assessment. Exactly. But, but I've never quite had anybody put it in the way you did or the way your team sergeant did. And, and, and probably we ought to counsel folks to do a bit more of that. Because in the end, that's what you're, you're trying to get folks to understand is do a self-assessment, be self-critical, understand your, your capabilities, your shortcomings. I, I kind of got to that over time. I think I've, I'm reasonably self-aware of, of some of my shortcomings. And over time, that's how I selected my senior NCO counterpart, command sergeant majors, uh, aides, XOs. Uh, they, they filled in the gaps that I knew I had in my personality and my characteristics that um, I, so I tried to team with them. And I would also warn subordinates early on, hey, I know I have some shortcomings. If, if I'm not giving you the praise you need or if I'm not giving you the feedback you need, come back and talk to me. Don't, don't be afraid to ask. It, yeah. It's just not my nature. I'm, I'm always, you know, I was always one of those. I can tell you all the great things we should work on as an organization to improve on. I don't spend a lot of time cheerleading on all the great stuff we've done. To me, it's always look forward, figure out how to get better. Not a lot on the patting on the back of the praise. I've tried to get better over the years. But, <laughs> but then I would hire a command sergeant major who was really good out walking around and making sure the guys knew how great they were doing. Exactly. So I, I use others to help me fill that role. Teamwork. There you go. One more thing as we transition to, to Green Bray Foundation is as we started to talk about kind of the, the role of, of senior leaders, sometimes you, you in a position of, of authority, you have to actually prevent youth from doing things that will, that are just too dangerous. I mean, that's why there's risk assessments and that's why there's all, all this stuff. And your first, face-to-face -face meeting at the board of the Green Bray Foundation. I, I told the story because it's very near and dear to my heart. Because in 2007, one of our go-ruck cadre, Mocha Mike, uh, Mike Vox, he was a first group team sergeant and he was there and he was going into Sodder City all the time. You know, that, that was his mission, running him out of, out of Baghdad. And, uh, you know, there was one night some SEALs had gone in and got chewed up pretty good, right? And, you know, there was a, there was a quick reaction for us. They had come back. They were they were no longer in harm's way, but the the call came down that the the SF team, the Special Forces team, was going to go back in, basically because there's one way in, one way out. They're going to go back in that same way right then, and and go pick a fight right then. And in Mocha Mike is the opposite of a coward. He's a he's a lion, right? And he's like, look, we'll do it. This is this is a horrible plan, and it kind of got pushed up and up and up. And you know these are guys going out every night. But, you know, tactics would dictate if there's been a huge gunfight, guess what? The, the guys that were in that gunfight, the bad guys, they, they didn't just go to sleep. They're sitting there hanging out, waiting for more dudes to come in and, and rush to where the gunfire was, maybe get some revenge or something like that. And so you have to take this tactical pause and say, it's not cowardly to, to wait <laughs> until a better strategic moment. Anyway, that, that decision got pushed up to you. It was a go. Everyone was going. And Mocha, Mocha Mike was like, I, I was sure I was going to die that night. And you put the kibosh on that mission and said that this isn't going out tonight. This is just not a good idea. You know, it, it's one of those things where I've heard that story from him a few times over, over some beers, Green Berets, drinking late at night, whatever. And he's, he's grateful for that form of leadership. It's not always a, a wise or a courageous thing to run toward the the, the gunfire or to seek revenge in a way that's going to take unnecessary risks. So, you know, as Green Berets, we're, we're proud to know when not to pull the trigger. That's one of those things that the more confident that you get, the easier that is to, to, to connect those dots when not to do it. But that story really, really stuck with me and was just made me really proud 
to, to be part of, of the community. And, and it, I think it's just an extraordinary leadership example. So that said, there are other missions and they're green lighted for all the, the right reasons and, you know, bad stuff happens. And so we both serve on, on the board of directors of the Green Bray Foundation. Talk about why that foundation is so important and, and necessary and what we do. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that those that listen to this podcast have gotten a sense of, of what we ask our Green Berets to do around the world. They're doing the hard work for the nation in a lot of, in a lot of dangerous and, and uh, tough situations. And, and, you know, yes, they're doing it because they volunteer to do it, but they're also doing it because somebody has to. And as a result, you know, sometimes, uh, it doesn't always go our way. I mean, I, you know, I, we told the story about our uh, our time in Northern Iraq the first time around, and you know, I thought I'd lose people and didn't. But unfortunately, on subsequent tours, we weren't quite as lucky. I've seen what it's like to to, to lose good people in combat. I've seen also the, the stress and strain that the kind of lifestyle puts on people and their families. And, and the Green Beret Foundation exists to help this great organization of folks that are committed to the nation's work deal with uh, bad things when bad things happen. Generally, we're, we're filling in where, where government programs end. Uh, I hope what you get from some of the things we've talked about today is uh, these men, and I keep saying men, but right, right now it is primarily men in the force. Or we have not yet had a successful Green Beret female candidate, but we will at some point. Um, but these men are a national treasure. I mean, these are kind of guys that have the intelligence, the drive, the character, and the experiences that can make any business more successful, walk into any environment in still civilian society and help improve whatever they touch. And so part of what we do as a Green Beret Foundation in the transition program is try and uh, make sure that they continue to live a, a life of good service to the nation and that the nation benefits from it. So really, Green Beret Foundation, in short, uh, we fill in the gaps where the, where the government programs and for, for those that need it, uh, but we're really trying to provide a support network for Green Berets and their families from start to finish. So obviously people can find out more at greenberetfoundation.org. And it's really been a privilege and an honor Sir, having you on Glorious Professionals. This is our longest podcast to date. It's uh was was hard to stop the train rolling. We we you kept bringing up these things. Well, we didn't get to this. We didn't get to this. Uh, there there's a lot a lot more stuff to to talk about. Not enough time. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for sharing so much with us. Yeah, my my pleasure. Face to face at some point. Thank you. All right. So, Rich, the good general has left the digital confines of the garage headquarters of Glorious Professionals podcast. W what did you think about my, my old commander? He's a great guy with a lot of knowledge, a lot of history, and very erudite in explaining just where he was, what he did, and all of the ramifications that that included. Yeah, so part, part of what I love about having some of these military folks that we have had on or, or want to have on there, there's a stigma out there that there's a lack of kind of thought or intellectualism that goes on in, in the military. And I, I just, I didn't find that to be true. I found oftentimes a different way of thinking that was not just all books all the time, but there, there's just a lot of thought from that, that man there about how to approach warfare and, leadership and, and all these kind of things that are inspiring, inspiring way of looking at the world. Well, and what came across to me was his empathy and his concern and interest in working with both his own people, the various teams that he was in charge of uh, as a battalion, as a company commander, as an ODA commander or operational detachment alpha commander, but as well as the indigenous forces that he was working with when he went to other countries. And that whole idea of empathy, communication, trust spills across not just military, but it, it spills across all aspects of life. 
particularly in what we're facing today with COVID-19. If you take the lessons learned of leadership, not the military aspect, just the lessons learned of leadership, how to work with people, how to recognize people, how to make people feel good about themselves and accept your leadership. That's key to me. So empathy, it, it's a big one, right? You don't have a lot of empathy when you're 22, at least I, I did. And I'm still working on it. You know, I, I probably align myself with General Tovo's approach, exactly what he talked about toward the end where he's just always focused on the next mission. And his trick as he got older was to surround himself with Sergeant Majors who, who were really good at telling everyone how great they were doing and all that stuff. And part of what I find interesting about this is, is man, I got a lot to learn, right? And I listen to someone like him talk. I'm like, man, I, I just, I want to spend more time around people like that. We all have a lot to learn. Even at my advanced age, I'm learning constantly. And one of the most important things you learn, and he brought it up, and that is you may be great as an individual and you have skills that maybe no one else has, but you also don't have skills that other people around you do. And so the idea of building a team and the team is stronger than the individual is so important to special forces. And it's so important in any leadership aspect, corporate, community, national, doesn't matter. So what else stuck out to you from some of his, if, if you had to kind of distill or think back to some of the stuff he, he talked about, what really rang true? Well, he, he talked a lot about some of the assignments he had, particularly in, in uh, Northern Iraq at two different times uh, during Provide Comfort in 91 and then later on in Viking Hammer in 2003. As he talked about that, I thought of old friends that I knew that had been there. Uh, his commander at the time during Provide Comfort in 91 was Colonel Dick Potter who I knew very well and later became brigadier and major general. And it, it made me think about he learned from so many people. And he alluded to this in, in his comments that it wasn't just him. West Point gave him a great basis to start with, an educational basis. But then he learned from everybody he came in contact with. That included officers, non-commissioned officers, State Department, uh, USAID, whoever it might be, you learn something from everyone. And he was kind of like the proverbial sponge, which is the way to go that you, you bring it all in, you, you take it all in, listen to it, and then you distill what you need to support what you're doing. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, it's like, you know, getting to hang out with Rich and General Tovo for a couple hours. I, I feel like I've been I've been learned pretty good uh, well, tonight. And, and I, I learned a lot from him. And, and I learn a lot from you from time to time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, once or twice a year, maybe, right? <laughs> uh, I, I'd go a little bit more than that. But it's, it's all about learning from those around you, taking the good things that you perceive that they've done that, are, that fit your style. Everything I do is not going to fit your style. Everything General Tovo does is not going to fit your style. What he, all the things he's done is not going to fit my style. And that's why being on a team, working together as a team to accomplish the mission. And that's what Special Forces is all about. That's what we're about right now in COVID-19, working as teams. So that's a, a really important point. And I, I think part of the evolution, and we spent a little bit of time talking about this, you know, the, the old wise man talking to, to the young man. I mean, it's even going on in the Tovo household with his son as, as a Green Beret, right? Absolutely. So the, the trick is, is that when you hear something like the discussion that we've had, you're not supposed to just become General Tovo. No. You're not supposed to become rich. You, you have to kind of go through these experiences where you learn what your style is. And it took me a really long time to get to the point where what your team sergeant talked to you about, Rich, is like, what's your weaknesses and stuff like that. You become more self-aware. And right. the other part of that is the sooner you figure that stuff out, the better, because you don't get extra time for being stupid longer, right? Right. <laughs> like that, that's not how it works. So no. you, you sort of say, hey, the more that you push, the more that you 
kind of dedicate yourself to, to something that's going to push your boundaries. I mean, special forces, the army, the military service in general, the Peace Corps, whatever, right? Get out there and push some boundaries. You'll learn a lot sooner and you'll be able to take advantage of those lessons for all the rest of your, the, the years of your life for however many that you have. And, and that's one of those things where I, I enjoy the diversity of, of guests that we're getting on this podcast because everyone has different styles and there's something to glean from, from each of them, but that doesn't mean that you want to emulate any one of them specifically. No, you have to be yourself. You have to take those pieces that you learn from each one and use them in your style, in your way, not my way, not his way, your way, whoever it might be out there listening to this podcast, take those principles and see which ones will work in your life, which ones will work for you or against you and pick the good ones. Only you can make that decision. I can give all kinds of anecdotal things all night long. It doesn't mean that you should be me. I don't want you to be me. I don't want you to be General Tobo. I don't want you to be Jason. I want you to be yourself. But we have lessons that we've learned the hard way that we can help you with and make you aware of. So on that note, we'd just like to thank you for tuning in to Glorious Professionals. If you find this kind of stuff fun, interesting, entertaining, and hopefully very educational, hope you tell your friends about it. Thanks so much for listening and we'll, we'll catch you next time.